Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details hope to see you on the inside done yo bros it's yo elliot here back with another episode of the yo elliot show and today i brought on one of my students he was in my king program for several months and he's got a great story we linked up uh we met at a church even though we know each other at a, uh, at a traditional church here in Orlando and have been friends ever since, uh, doing some really cool things. I thought it would be great for you to hear from Jesse. What's going on, Jess? How you doing, Elliot? Thanks awesome. for having me. Yeah, thank you, dude. You're a busy guy. Yeah. That's right. You're in, uh, you're in school to be an electrician right now, right? Correct. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. You know, one of the things that I think men are waking up to is the reality of trades as a viable or probably a better option than most university study courses. Um, what has been your experience with, uh, you know, finding a path, choosing, being an electrician, and why did you, why did you decide to do that? Yeah, so, uh, so as a teenager, um, I was really passionate about music. I played drums. Uh, that's, that's my main instrument, but I was sure for a long time that all I wanted to do was play music, yeah. tour, travel around in beater vans or whatever, and just play shows because I loved, I just loved it. It was all I wanted to do. Um, but, you know, over time, uh, to kind of put it into a nutshell, I had a soul crisis and I found out that a lot of my identity was wrapped up in drumming and I got burnt out on it. I got burnt out on music. And, um, and so I started looking for deeper meaning in life, got on the new age path and meditation, self-improvement, a lot of dabbling in a lot of different things. Um, but ultimately in my searching, I kept coming back to the need to have something more to offer yeah. and to take more responsibility and um, be somebody who people could rely on. And I always wanted to have a family. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a second thought once I really started getting into music. But as I got into my 20s, I realized, all right, well, if I want to have a family, I don't want to be a dad who's just on the road all the time and mm -hmm. hardly making any money, doing something very unstable. So I knew I needed to have more consistency in my life and buckle down on something and just be somebody who has more to offer than a than musical talent. Right. Some sort of practical skill. How old are you? 29 now. Just turned 29. 29. So you're millennial, I guess yes. you say, or Gen Z kind of. Yep. And, um, you know, I'm like a an old millennial. I'd say I was born in 79. So I'm like right on the cusp of Generation X and millennial. And I have this 
I've always had this millennial mindset and I didn't know how I developed it until I looked around and realized that all the kids, kids younger than me, young people, had the same sort of pie in the sky ambitions that I always had. And I really believe that I could do anything. I could be anything. I could change the world. That's sort of like the sentiment that I think most millennials have. And then it seems like the reality hits. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, I can't do whatever I want. I can't be whatever I want. Um, in fact, reality requires that I do something that is profitable. Was that like mind shattering for you? Was that, that it was a disappointing to realize that, you know what? Maybe I'm not going to be a musician. I got to do something practical. What was that experience like? It was, it was a slow process getting there, but, um, I, I slowly came to the realization that doing the things that I was most passionate about weren't really bringing me fulfillment. It was just very selfish. Mm, um, mm -hmm. And so I was doing, like, I love to get out into nature, do backpacking, and I love music. I love playing drums, playing different instruments. And I was doing that with, with most of my time. Um, but it was just, there was an emptiness that I couldn't fill with anything. Uh, I started getting into self-improvement, which yeah. did quite a bit for me. I got, like, I found out about the no-fat movement. I had bad problems with porn. Um, started eating healthier, started getting into fitness. Uh, but, yeah, that only went so far. So, so slowly, um, you know, that led to me finding God and uh, the need to, to be more mature. And it was, it was refreshing to start a new path and um, like getting into the trades thinking, wow, I, I'm actually learning valuable stuff. I don't have to just ask friends for favors all the time. Yeah. Um, but it was it was also really hard to let go of what I was so identified with because starting starting a new path uh, multiple times there were different phases to it, but and there still are right now. But um, it was it was hard sometimes just being new at all these different things and wanting to go back to what I was really good at and what I really enjoyed doing. Um, so. Yeah, I guess to wrap that up, it was it was humbling. Yeah, follow your passion. That's another one, right? Yep. Do what you love, and um, it it's kind of humbling to realize that okay, maybe what I love is not that important. And as you said, it comes from this sort of selfish place where it's all about how I can fulfill my goals, my dreams, my self gratification. Um, very rarely does that begin with how can I. Um, really help people or be of value to the world, yeah. unless it comes in the form of self-aggrandization, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to be the big helper of the world, yep. and, right? And that's, yep. I get it. I totally get it. I don't knock it at all because it's, uh, it's, a noble, uh, it's a noble idea. When it comes to choosing something practical, you know, a lot of guys might be listening to this and like, oh, that's like a letdown. What, yeah. what made you, you know, you said it felt good to do something practical. What made you choose uh, electronics uh, or electrician school yeah. um, as something that would be worthwhile? Um, so I, I'll try and keep this quick, but after music, I was really like, I was really far left on things. So I wanted to get into um, sustainable agriculture mm -hmm. and greener living, you know, save the planet, that kind of stuff. Totally. Uh, total ego trip, like you were just kind of alluding to. Mm -hmm. um, and then having spent time in that world, I realized a lot of it was just uh, a lot of these people and myself included didn't have any real skin in the game mm -hmm. in anything, just pretending to care about um, the planet and all these bigger things. But I didn't have my own basic stuff sorted out myself. Um, so, yeah, like I said before, you know, I was into Jordan Peterson. I'm not a fan of his anymore, but cleaning your room, um, 
being organized, being disciplined. I got really into like Jocko Willink and David Goggins and stuff like that. Um, and I was, I was like, okay, well, I don't want to do this whole environmentalism thing anymore. I think a lot of it's just, uh, narcissistic and, and l about being in a fantasy. So, uh, I listened to my friends and my dad and people who kind of recommended what I might be good at. Jordan Peterson also talked about, he recommended getting into the trades and I was mm -hmm. like, you know, I like, I'm detail oriented. I really like learning new skills. Um, so yeah, people, people in my life kind of, kind of guided me to that. And mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to learn some kind of trade, but, uh, yeah, I ended up settling on electrical. Yeah. You know, uh, we like to think of ourselves as novel idea creators, right? Like, oh, I'm going to do something that everybody else is not doing. When the fact is, most of the time when we think we're being individuals, we're actually just following the narrative. We're yeah. doing what Disney taught us to do since we were four years old, and then Nickelodeon, and then YouTube, and so on and so forth. Um, so that was the case for you. That was the case for me. Uh, it led you, of course, it doesn't fulfill and it led you to trying to fill that hole with some, you know, self-development and new age stuff. You mentioned that you were left leaning. Mm -hmm. What was your, you know, what was your experience like that in that phase of your life, right? Because I know a lot of guys, at least the ones that were probably watching me for a while have disappeared <clears throat> at this point. But I think most of us can relate to uh, that draw. What was that like? And what was your experience when you were in that phase? Um. Yeah, the draw was, uh, I did have a genuine hunger for God. I I can say that, you know, in hindsight, but it was wrapped up in a lot of selfishness, a lot of desire for, for peace and tranquility mm -hmm. and being liked by people, you yeah. know, being seen as deep and insightful and just, yeah, wanting, wanting to have my own sense of peace in life. Um, and so I got into meditation, I got into yoga and, and there was, there was, there were many benefits that I got from those things, um, which have carried over into prayer life mm -hmm. today. Sure. Yeah. But it was, it's just missing something. And, you know, I never, I never became really well educated in Buddhism or yoga or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I just kind of dabbled. But from what I saw in, in all the circles that I was in, the people that I was involved with, it was, they were all very selfish and, uh, and kind of lazy. Right. Know? It's a lot of self aggrandization. Mm -hmm. Um, again, like I've been there, I totally get it. Like I said, I'm an old millennial, you know, how can I stand out? How can I make people look up to me? How can I be in or seen as important yep. to other people? Um, when did you turn the focus of attention from your ego and self-aggrandization to the transcendent, to God, and specifically through traditional Catholicism that you find yourself in now? Yeah, so, so I started learning about Jesus, and I was very anti-Christian in high school and yep. as a teenager. Um, both out of ignorance and just immaturity, but I started, I, I got mm -hmm. to the point where I was like, all right, well, let me, let me actually listen to what Christ had to say right. rather than just, you know, knocking it without really, without really having open ears. What were some of the maybe misconceptions or wrong ideas that you had about, uh, Christianity, Jesus and the faith? Um, I, well, I pointed at the the scandals happening in the church sure. yep. um which is not representative of christianity as a whole but just as the state of things but i like i said i was very immature um i was not into the idea of having to live according to an objective order to right life. yeah um and just i didn't understand the mercy aspect of Christianity there hmm. that you can, I thought it was hypocritical. I thought it was, um, I thought it contradicted itself, but 
What do you mean by that? The whole aspect of judging sin, judging um, objectively between moral good and evil. Right. I I was against that because, you know, I thought, oh, things were things are more complicated than that. You can't right. just put things in these boxes and. Uh, who are these people to judge me? Or if mm-hmm. God, if God's judgmental to me, or if He would punish me, then He must. I, that's that's not a God that I want to follow. Um, How do you understand it now? Like, why would a good God judge you and have rules and boundaries for you? I mean, a very simple example would be your father when you're young telling you not to run into the street. Right. Um, you know, you might think he's just being a, a party pooper when you're a kid, but he's trying to protect you. Um, and now I see, I mean, I've, I've sinned enough in my life that has yeah. caused me a great deal of misery. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually what happens. I mean, that was the case for me. I became so deluded and so lost yeah. that, you know, hitting rock bottom was like, okay, you know, my old idea was I can save myself. Yeah. And when I realize I can't do that, I'm like, I, I'm trying to save myself here with all these techniques, all these meditations, all these books. Right. And there was this ego gratification associated with this effort that my will can do it. Uh, but you mentioned God's mercy, and God's grace. And you know, at some point, I'm sure for you, kind of just talking about myself here for a moment, mm-hmm. I had to let go and say, I can't do this maybe this Jesus can save me. Maybe I need to be saved. What was that uh, moment like for you? Um, yeah, I I had to come to terms with the fact that because I was totally on that on that high horse of, oh, well, I whatever, whatever problem I have in life, I'll fix it myself. Yeah. You're the only one who can fix your own problems. And that's kind of a narrative that you hear in the in the self-improvement world. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's retarded now when I look back on it that I could actually <laughs> yeah. convince myself of that. But right. um, yeah, I realized I was, I was looking for, for what it means to be a man. And I was listening to all these different people and, and their ideas. And I heard a lot of, oh yeah, well, you have to follow your heart. You have to follow your right. intuition. Yeah. But what are the parameters of that? And everybody right. has different ideas of, of what those parameters are. And so I just kept wondering, I was so confused and lost and wondering what is it, what does it mean to be a man? How do I be, how, how can I be a valuable man and what I'm supposed to be? Who do I follow? What do I follow? I need an example of the, the perfect, the ideal role model in order to start moving in that yeah. direction. What was your experience like with your earthly father? Uh, my dad gave me a lot of good skills in life. He taught me how to be respectful, disciplined, having a strong work ethic, and he was very supportive. Um, so I have a, a lot of yeah. gratitude towards my father, and there's there's a lot that I didn't understand about him growing up. Mm-hmm. I thought that he was just – he didn't get it. He was too harsh and, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm so sensitive and sophisticated. And, yeah. And so I don't, I don't want to be like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there were, there were pieces missing from, from our relationship, looking back on it, um, which really just comes down to God and having faith and having an ultimate direction for all right. these things. Because I thought, you know, why, why should I work hard? Why should I, um, why should I stay on the straight and narrow? Like, why can't I just do what I want? What's all this for? Right. Um, you know, both of us come from uh, strong fathers, good fathers. Um, it took me a long time to atone with my father, come back and realize that, oh, he was on to something this whole time. And both of us being sort of led astray, led away from our fathers. What do you think it is in the world that, what is the narrative that turns men away from even good fathers? Well, there's a lot to that, um, but we all have a lower nature. We all have, you know, a child inside of us that just wants what it wants when it wants it. Um, yeah. And 
And then you have everybody and everything telling you, do what you feel, um, follow your heart. And, um, you know, men are, men are so bad. Men are just mean and they're aggressive and they're basically lesser versions right. of women. Right. Um, and, and all the bad things that happened in the world, wars and all that, and conquests <laughs> is because of men. Yeah. Right. Never anything good. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and when you're babied like that and you have these, um, these pitfalls in your nature that, that leads you towards being selfish or seeking instant gratification, um, avoiding austerity is very seductive to hear those kind of messages and to, and to agree with the world like, Oh yeah, well, well, men really are that bad. And another thing is there are, you know, genuinely a lot of fathers out there who just like Bishop Sheen, uh, describes the idea of there being a cross without a Christ mm. and, and vice versa too. But um, there's a lot of parents out there who it's just the disciplining isn't about guiding the child to a good place. It's more about like shooing the fly away. Like, oh, you're bothering mm. me, so I'm going to shut you down. Right. There's, a, there's that, and then there's the overly soft father, overly lenient, um, who doesn't do his job in, in setting – order for the household. So you that was really interesting. You mentioned that there's the cross without the Christ and then vice versa. Yep. Christ without the cross. I think what I hear you saying is that um, there's the toughness, which is the cross without the love. Right. And that a lot of young men are turned away from their fathers as a result, specifically because the world kind of tells us that our dads should be like moms. Yes. Right? Like motherly love is so... Uh, held in such high regard, but fatherly love is different. Um, and then you have the opposite, which is uh, the cr the Christ without the cross, which is maybe what we get in a lot of, I don't want to say new age Christianity, but essentially that's mm -hmm. what it is, um, where a, a lot of Christian men are shown a depiction of Christianity that is, is just soft and effeminate. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Ned Flanders from the Simpsons kind of Christianity. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, we just have a really immature understanding of what love is in the modern day. Most, most of us think of love as just giving people what they want, not being willing to be harsh when necessary and tell the truth when it's uncomfortable. Yeah. If you're watching somebody, uh, you know, walking towards a cliff, then you're not being nice by by letting them, oh, you do you, just go ahead. You know, you can walk right off if that's right. what you want. That's like mommy's love. Yeah. Right? Like as long as you're happy, as <laughs> yeah. long as you feel good, you know, that I'm doing my job. Right. And then what we end up doing is, you know, this is always the case and the enemy knows this, we superimpose our ideas, which aren't even our ideas, they're what the culture promotes, uh, upon God the Father, and they think God is supposed to be some sort of um, mommy mm -hmm. um, rather than a father that creates boundaries. Right. And there, there is, you know, there is an element to God's mercy that, that rings true to that, like the story of the prodigal son. He went off and squandered all the good gifts that he had. He was living like a total turd, and, but God welcomed him back when he repented. It's a matter of the heart. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's, God forgives when we're willing to, to turn around, to turn and away. And that's from the mercy, us. right? That's the mercy, but you have to be willing to, to turn away from the bad things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're not being a good parent if, if your child's acting up and you just, you just tell your child, okay, well, that's, you know, you're just expressing yourself or, or that's just my little Johnny. That's how he is. Uh, I'm going to let him do what he wants to. Right. Who am I to say mm -hmm. what's right and what's wrong? And real love is mercy and justice, right? right. Mercy being maybe the, the softer love, right? The Christ without the cross, maybe. And then justice being just, being, oh, no, you're going to be held to a standard. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you can't, if, 
if you're not being held to a standard, then you can't really mature. Like specifically for men, it, it applies to both men and women, but specifically for men, you have to be held to a standard before you can really become a man. Right. And a lot of Christianity today uh, is sort of imbalanced. Um, let's let's approach the you know once saved always saved dogma of most Protestants, <clears throat> where uh, Christ is so merciful that um, even if you do sin, uh, He's going to love you anyway, as long as you said these magic words at some point in your life. Um, how is that? How is that version of Christianity uh, damaging to men? Well, there's no, there's no accountability and there's, there's no real cost that's being asked of you if you want to. But, but Jesus paid the the price. Right. That's what they'll say. Right. Well, it's written in the Bible that faith without works is dead. And it's funny because Protestants are all about, you know, referring to scripture, referring to the Bible, but. Right. But you have to you have to actively do good works in your life mm -hmm. in order to to develop and be sanctified, God willing. Right. Um, and I've I've experienced it too. I've before I started actively going to confession, right. I just thought, oh well, why can't it? I can repent in my room, and I can just it, it can be between me and God, and uh, and and He's merciful; He'll forgive me. But there was there was no change that was really facilitated without actually putting working. it out there, yeah. working, putting in work, putting in work, being willing to hear um, what I'm supposed to do for my penance too, so I don't just continue along the same path and take for granted. Oh well, I can I can go off the rails as much as I want to, and God's just gonna forgive me when really your heart is is just in the same selfish dark place that it was before, right. And then, you know, the men today are crying for austerity. Men today are crying for rigor because life is just so soft that it's boring and unfulfilling. And we're starting to wake up to that realization. Um, as a fellow traveler like yourself, a seeker, you know, I've been through various different religious uh, traditions and when I realized that, you know, I hit rock bottom here and I need some guardrails, I need somebody to tell me what to do, I was drawn, for, well, first of all, uh, there was a time when I was drawn to a, a, a branch of Islam called Baha'i, uh, and knowing that even in the Baha'i faith, there's a, a lot of rigor, you know, you're, there are obligatory prayers, you must pray, like a, a Muslim pr must pray five times a day, Um and I didn't realize, given that, you know, Christianity has been so defaced in the West, um, even Catholicism has been really defaced and, and, and watered down and, you know, turned into something that is soft and easy. I never imagined that there's actually a tradition, uh, you know, the, the, the ancient tradition of the church that actually requires men to man up. And uh, this is what I found in traditional Catholicism. And it sounds like you've done the same. What what drew you maybe back to the Catholic faith, and what do you find in it that bolsters this uh, budding masculine sense in you? Yeah. So so just uh, going back to to where I'm at as far as my baptism, all that stuff. Um, I was actually baptized Orthodox in the Armenian Apostolic Church as an infant. And I had no idea that I was baptized Orthodox oh, wow. until, you know, a few years ago when I was um, talking about it with a priest. But my, for all practical purposes, my true introduction to the church was to a Russian Byzantine Catholic church. Oh man, I that's, love it. Yeah, that's, that's, so that's Eastern Catholicism. It's, it's basically, uh, I wouldn't be the best person to explain it, but it's, it's like attending an Orthodox liturgy that's in communion with Rome. Yeah. So, and I have a, a priest in California who I really miss named Father Sebastian, um, who I want to, next time I visit, I think I want to actually officially become Eastern Catholic because I really wow. like the East and the West. And that was my introduction to it the It seems church. that the East has retained a lot more of the tradition than the West. Um, 
why do you think that is? Why did the West fall into modernism at such a, a faster rate than uh, Eastern Catholicism and Christianity? You know, that's that's a good question. Um, I mean, the West has had more of a reach, that's for sure. Yeah. more. There's a lot more Catholics out there than, than Orthodox Christians. So, um, you know, knowing what we do about Satan and the nature of evil, it wants to invert and corrupt what is good and true. So with with a, a true faith that reaches that far and has so much influence on so many people, I mean, it only makes argue. sense. Yeah, it only makes sense that that's where he would want to really focus his efforts. But yeah, I I don't have a, I don't have a definitive answer on that. That's for yeah, sure. you know, I, again, I like yourself. I don't have a definitive answer, but I there are um, signposts. You know, uh, Eastern Christians saw a lot more. Uh, they they experienced a lot more pain than Western. Uh, Christians, well, you know, there was pain, of course, in the West, but the Orthodox split had a lot to do with the Ottoman uh, takeover of Constantinople, right? So there was the early, of course, early split, but it had a lot to do with the pain that was experienced by Eastern Christians. Um, but then, you know, as early as the Bolshevik Revolution, right, like when mm -hmm. the, the, the the Marxists um, and, you know... I, <laughs> I don't know how to say it lightly, but, uh, you know, all the Marxists were um, Jews, started to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, persecute the Christians. In the West, it was all physical austerities, right? It was all pain, you know, bo bombs and bullets, famine, you know, doing very harsh things that I think they discovered caused Christians to hunker down on their faith because they were creating so many martyrs. And you know that you've ever heard that, uh, you know, the the... The, the seed of the church, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Right. Right. Where in the West, it was a cultural takeover. It was how can we pervert their culture rather than make them suffer physically? Because they knew mm -hmm. that they couldn't, you know, uh, they couldn't compete with the military might of Western Europe and the United States. Right. Yeah. That's, those are good insights. I hadn't really considered that part of it. Yeah. And so we began uh, the the march towards modernism, right? Which was, uh, you know, Freemasonic as well. I don't want to leave them out. I mean, it's all one thing, Marxist and- Yeah, is there really a separation between any of those? It's all one thing, I think. Um, there are some terms that they use to describe it collectively, but today we could just maybe just describe it as uh, modernism, right? Right. And it was all uh, individualism. You know, one of the things that like- I'm struggling with right now because I love being American and, you know, I, I love what America stands for in many regards, but uh, all these revolutions that were against cross and crown ended up destroying order. And then uh, Father Ripperger calls it uh, eminence, making the person the God, making my ego the God rather than the transcendent other or a, you know, a, a, an external authority. I become my own authority. Yeah, taking individualism too far. Mm -hmm. yeah. We call it new age because now it's sort of blended in with this uh, religion of all, right? Like everything can be accepted. Everything is okay. And it's sort of like a, a, a stew of philosophies that people can just pick and choose what they want. Yeah, which I think I think there's been changes over time with that because, you know, the idea of freedom in America, as far as what I've been learning and, and understanding is there were, there were way more confines to that. It was, it was within the confines of a Christian nation that you had freedom. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that you could just do whatever you wanted to without there being any consequences for it. Right. And that's kind of the weapon that, that some are using right now, you know, the right. J's and, and so forth that, uh, that is subverting the West and trying to yeah. trying to confuse people's ideas about what this nation was about in the first place. Yeah, it's become foreign to to most people. Yeah, it's funny because um, E. Michael Jones, uh, you know, libido dominandi. I love referring to that. Um, talks about how this sort of freedom actually leads to slavery, and then we become slaves to vice. <clears throat> yes. Right. And if someone is slave and a slave is a slave to vice, 
Uh, Aquinas says that their intellect is darkened. And even uh, Paul says it in the Bible. He says, uh, God will give them up to their lusts. Yeah. And that's essentially what it is, right? So when somebody says, you're free and no one should tell you what to do, if it feels good, that means it's right. Well, then you quickly become a slave to our most base nature or concupiscence. Yeah. And there's no limit to it. That's the thing. Mm. And that's the cross was something that I that I rejected and the whole the whole reality of there being an objective truth because it sounded so confining and oh it's just gonna it's just gonna be nothing but uh, no fun for my life if I accept those things. But what I found was it was a huge relief to be able to follow a pattern, to follow a code to living my life because I I found out through experience that I couldn't handle uh, establishing the limits and the boundaries to mm-hmm. everything, to my pleasure, uh, to what's right and wrong, uh, good and evil. I couldn't handle any of that stuff. I did a lot of psychedelics and just got really lost trying to contemplate all those things. And then, you know, eventually I just realized, wow, yeah, who, who was I to think that I could handle that and put that on my own shoulders? Right. So it's a, it's a relief to have to find meaning in suffering too. That's another thing because mm. <clears throat> there's, there was that whole, that whole message that people are still kind of pushing right now of, oh, well, you have to go travel the world. You have right. to go find yourself. Mm-hmm. You have to, you know, be a minimalist, but then go travel and, and seek all these new experiences. Mm-hmm. And I, I found that that's just a different kind of materialism. And, uh, and it doesn't bring any fulfillment. Like, okay, I went here, I went there, I've experienced this and that. Well, there's no end to that. Like, you couldn't even spend your whole life visiting all these different places in the world and having having all these different experiences. Yeah. And I thought I actually stressed out about about the different stresses in my life and, and suffering that I was experiencing, thinking mm-hmm. that it was something I just had to run away from all the right. time. And then you see people on social media, it looks like they're living an amazing life. Yeah. You watch TV and movies and everybody's adventure is amazing. Um, I think that men have an inherent sense that suffering is required for growth. I know that my journey of personal development began with strength training. Right. And um, and I think most men will agree that like we kind of enjoy putting our bodies through pain. Right. Suffering in the gym. Right. Because we know that on the other end of that, there's some growth. Um, Speak a little bit to the virtue of suffering. How can one who is suffering now, you know, really accept the idea that it's good to suffer and that our perfect example in Christ uh, elevates our suffering, redeems us as a way, uh, as a way. Well, another really simple example of that is if if we didn't suffer, we would have never left the crib. We could we would have just kept sitting there, you know, being babies, having candy or milk or mom's mm. tin brought to us mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, so we know that we we recognize the need for growing pains in childhood and and then somewhere along the line we just don't want to we don't want to have to suffer anymore once we get established enough according to our own standards then we we think oh well we don't have to deal with that anymore and i can just kind of maintain status quo or seek out pleasure on my own i can do whatever i want to um but that really doesn't end that whole process that that everyone recognizes as taking place in childhood. And um, just this past Lent, you know, I did, it was my toughest Lent yet. Yeah. Um, and it was really trying on my patience and humbling. Um, but I was able to get through it with God's help and through prayer. And then coming out of it, I just felt so much joy that you don't you don't get that sort of thing just just hanging out and chill. Yeah. Like a good father, I think what God does is he allows us to suffer so that we can see number one our own our you know that you can do it, yep. but also I'm here for you. You'll be okay. I got you. I think about my children 
And you know, I was much younger when they were young, so I was a little bit, you know, tougher with them, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would let them fall, right? You know, I'd let, I have my son or daughter hold on to like a monkey bar, and then I'd, I'd take my arms away, and they kind of freak out a little bit. And then as their hands were starting to pry, and they felt I'd catch them, yeah. <laughs> and it was sort of just a way to show them, hey, look, you're you're going to be okay. You hung in there. You were freaking out. You did the best you could, but. The grace of the Father. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's such a good <laughs> He example. loves you, and he's not going to let you hurt yourself. And even if there were times when they started getting bigger, I would let them actually fall. And they they realize, oh, well, I'm, I'm actually okay. It was because I know it's not that far. I think a lot of times God sees that in us where we're like afraid to maybe lose this relationship or lose this job. And to us, it's everything. We're holding on with our might. And then when we can't do it anymore and we fall and we hit the ground, we realize, huh, I'm actually okay. And in fact, things are a bit better down here than they were up there. Yeah, that's that's something that you when you are attentive to what's happening in your life, you start to trust that process more and more. Mm -hmm. um, you can be in, you can find yourself in some situations in life where, where you're thinking, man, why, why am I even here? How is this even my reality right now? I, I got to get out of here. I got to escape it. I resent this to the core. And, and then it's not until later that you realize the kind of, gifts that you've gotten from it, the virtues, whatever, patience, um, long suffering, endurance, mm -hmm. um, attaining wisdom, yeah, whatever it might be. If you're, and you can, you can go your whole life being blind to it and just cursing everything, bad thing that happens to you and feeling sorry for yourself. But you can, if you really want to find wisdom, you can, you can recognize that process and, and learn to trust it over time uh -huh. like oh yeah god is really he really wants the best for me and i don't know what's best for me i wouldn't choose these things i wouldn't right. choose these hardships myself i want i want things to be much more comfortable as as much as you know i might not want to admit that if i'm honest yeah i would choose comfort most of the time um yeah. i love that you mentioned virtue because i tend to think of virtue as like the muscles of the soul Right, that's where we're actually growing. The only difference is that we don't see it on our bodies. We might not see it in the mirror. It might not be obvious to everyone. But really, that's the that's what God's training us for through all of our experiences, right? Yeah, yeah, and it improves your life so greatly the more you attain it, and it's it's something that you can't really. It's hard to to convey that to people because there's nothing, um, there's nothing dazzling and alluring about right. it. Like with, with the new age stuff, oh, you're gonna attain enlightenment and and find spiritual bliss. And that's so vague. Yeah, it is. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah, I, yeah. I don't even know what it's supposed to mean and I don't, I don't trust it anymore, right. but I, what happened with me is with starting to go to church, I had a, my good friend, Tristan, um, was really becoming a strong, strongly Christian. And he found, he and, and my friend Greg found this, that Russian Byzantine church that I was telling you about. Yeah, I saw Tristan and his wife, also my good friend, Dana, get baptized at that church. And I thought, wow, there's, there's really something to this. And I didn't realize that Christianity could be like this. Yeah. Um, but without going too far down that direction, I, I wasn't uh, just completely in love with it right away. It wasn't, it wasn't that same sensual kind of magnetism. I just, right. I just kept thinking, you know, what I've been doing isn't working. I recognize there's something to this. And I never liked the idea of faking it till you make it. Because I thought, oh, well, I want to, before I get into something, I want to have a thorough understanding of it and right. think it through and know what I'm getting myself into. But um, I was doing that to a to a large extent, just showing up to church and thinking, well, why why am I here? And hearing, you know, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I'm thinking, you know, I'm... I think I'm a pretty decent guy. Like, why do <laughs> right. I have to, why do I have to I'm repent? a good person. Yeah, yeah. And just having those thoughts kind of fighting it. 
and and hearing these prayers, I'm like, well, I don't know what these prayers mean. But then over time, it kind of started to unfold and it would just be during the most mundane experiences in everyday life at work or whatever, where something would click all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, so there was, there was just something deeper there that was, that was drawing me to it. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, sensual or, or anything like that. Right. That's been my experience completely. Like when I hit rock bottom, um, God, I don't know, the Holy Spirit, something in my heart said, go and confess your sins. And I'm like, what does that even mean, right? Mm -hmm. And so I realized, oh, well, I'm a baptized Catholic. And it was the last thing I was thinking. I knew nothing about the faith. I didn't want to know anything about faith. Like yourself, I had a lot of wrong ideas about the faith. But I I don't know what it was, but I just kept going. I just, I just kept my heart open to it. And it's amazed me how deep, how profound, you know, the doctors and the saints of the church, 2,000 years of tradition, um, so much that like it's a never-ending source of exploration both internally and, you know, understanding the history of what this is all about. So I think a lot of times we have to assent to a faith first, like just give ourselves over to it and say, I don't get it, I don't understand. I'm not sure I even like this thing. <laughs> yeah. But I have a sense that I'm being called here. Let me walk the path and see where it leads me. It sounds like that was a case for you. Yeah, very much. And um and some of Jesus's most profound words in my life have been uh you will know them from their fruits. Mm. Judging judging something by its fruits, you know, you might not you might not be smart enough. I'm not smart enough to understand all the all the different theological points about the faith. Like sure. I, I want to keep exploring it, but I know I'm only so smart to to grasp all of it. But you have to you can't you can't understand every little detail about everything before you make a decision. Right. Mystery. Yeah. <laughs> right. Some things are we're allowed to just not know. Right. Right. Or if if you're picking a good doctor, then uh, you, you're not going to go to medical school and learn all of that stuff and and verify every little checkpoint that he's legit. You know, you're right. just going to you want to look at his reputation, how he presents himself or whatever. And it's um, a little egotistical, too. Right. Like f the previous version of myself, like I had to learn all about and research and make an intellectual and egotistical choice about it rather than really giving up and allowing God's grace to uh, bless us with that virtue of faith. Yeah, yeah. It, I didn't want to give up. I wanted to do everything myself. and right. Give a good yeah. reason why. Yeah, yeah. And I never, I'm, I don't think I probably came across as people to an egotistical kind of guy, like, mm -hmm. you know, chest out, it's all about me or whatever. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but inside, you know, I was just, it's like, the effeminacy of overthinking and yeah. trying to take everything into into my own hands that was a big problem for me so i yeah. i've really had and i'm still learning how to how to surrender those things you said that you'll know them by their fruits which kind of like brings me back to one of your original <laughs> points when we started talking about the faith that you were baptized um, orthodox and orthodoxy is is gaining steam you know yes. a lot of people are, why not just stick with being orthodox? Why assent to the Catholic faith? Um, you know, basically, I I really resonate with the East. Like that's where yeah. my heart's at. <laughs> Me too, dude. But I've been but I've been gaining so much wisdom from both sides, mm. and in in praying for for unity of the church. Yeah, like it's from everything that I've seen, both East and West are valid. Yeah. Um, but the, the Eastern Catholic church in, in many regards, uh, is kind of a, an attempt to, to move towards that direction of unity between the East and the West. And it, it comes with, I mean, you end up getting rejected from both sides a lot of the time. I know because, uh, my friends, Tristan and Dana, they, they experience that, you know, sometimes instead of being able to, you know, go receive communion at either church, um, you get rejected from both sides, but but first and foremost, that was my introduction to the faith, and second, yeah, I I have gained so much from East and West, 
and I I would like to be in communion with both. It looks almost as if that's kind of happening in a way. I I don't know the exact story, but it seems like there was, I think, a bishop, an Orthodox bishop, who uh, like came into communion with the church, and his entire diocese came with him. Are you familiar with this story? Ah, uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah, it seems as if you know, and I'm not a historian, but I got bits and pieces that the Great Schism was more of a political move, uh, a sort of a fight between certain egotistical leaders. And most of the, especially, you know, uh, 1,500 years ago, or it was about a little over a thousand years ago, when that split happened, most Christians who were all, ca- it was one church at that time. There was no, you know, of course they had the schisms, but, you know, like we do today, we can get to that in a moment. Mm-hmm. But most of them had no idea what was going on. They had different cultures, but it was more of a political split between the, the hierarchy rather than uh, the believers themselves. And so that, that, healing, I think, is more available to the split between the East and the West Church than, say, perhaps between uh, Protestants and I'm going to lump Christian and Orthodoxy uh, or uh, Orthodoxy and Catholicism Mm -hmm. in, you know, it's all Orthodox, you know, in a way, the Orthodox face. What is the difference, say, you know, a lot of Americans who are, especially, you know, people who watch my videos or you see on YouTube, you know, they're they're called by Christ to return, but it's to a Protestant sect. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think is the difference there? Why didn't you move towards a, a Protestant sect, which is maybe a little bit easier to get involved with, you know, and, you know, more popular in, in, in America? Oh, man, it's just a sense of, before I even started learning about what Protestants believe, just that's that's what I really thought that church was mm-hmm. like. You know, somebody singing with a guitar and mm-hmm. um, just being too sugary sweet. It just I had a visceral visceral reaction to it. Like it, I felt I feel sick. I still do. When I, <laughs> and they're so nice I, though. Yeah, they're they're, they're a lot like, nicer than Orthodox and, and Catholics. I've I've yeah. noticed. You know, I go to any Protestant church. If you go there and you're the the first time there, they all want to shower you with friendship, right? And you go to a traditional church, uh, and it's just quiet, and everybody's kind of prayerful, and they're not even looking at you. They don't even notice you. Yeah, it's because there's, I, I'm not going there for for people to be nice, and yeah. I experienced that with a lot of the New Age stuff, and yeah. it's just kind of. It's cheap. I yeah. You're you're supposed to be there to be reverent, right? So, yeah, I just didn't. I didn't get any of that with. Protestant I always churches. like the pe Like I don't want to say I like the people. They're likable, right? And a part of what turned me away from going to just another Protestant church was, I'm going to get bombarded with people who want to pretend to be my friend. Yeah, yeah. It's like a sales pitch or something, something along those lines. It just doesn't feel real, right? And yeah, like a sales sales pitch or a solicitor coming to your door. I, yeah, I, it didn't feel genuine. I wanted I wanted more authenticity, something deeper, also deeper than you know. And I, God forbid me for saying this, but I know I'm in alignment when I say it. But deeper than just what the Bible says, right? Right. How about two thousand years of tradition? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know all the different interpretations of what the Bible says, right. omissions of so many different pieces of it. It's it's incomplete and and warped. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's, I, I want the truth. I mean, it, sometimes the truth isn't fun, but at the end of the day, that's what I'm looking for. Mm-hmm. So um, I know you because you watched my videos, perhaps for a long time. Yeah. When did, what was the first time you uh, found Yo Elliot on YouTube? Oh man, yeah. The first time I found one of your videos was um, probably 2014, 2015, something okay. like that. And it was during a time when I was I was really serious about music, and I was living out of um, my rehearsal space with my friend Tristan. We were living between a rehearsal space and uh, a box truck taking showers at the gym and stuff like that. Um, but I was just 24 seven practicing drums. Like, yeah. and, uh, and so I, I saw one of your videos talking about, um, how weightlifting for you helped you develop character 
And that was, that was your path that you found. And the austerity of it was something that even I wasn't even, um, uh, looking for that, like mm-hmm. consciously at that time. Yeah. But I resonated with my, with my practice routine, with drumming, with how you were describing weightlifting. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, oh, this is, yeah, this is really cool. And, and I didn't, I thought maybe when I saw your thumbnail that I just see, you know, a meatheaded guy talking about weights, mm-hmm. but I, I loved listening to you speak and, mm-hmm. and touch on deeper matters. And I was also really looking for, for leadership. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, you really checked off quite a few of those boxes there. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm kind of an OG, one of the first guys on yeah. YouTube and probably one of the first like intellectual meatheads, right? Like, you know, most people watch me because it was about lifting. Yeah. But then, uh, as I have always been, it goes deeper. I want to know. I want to know everything. I want to talk about everything. Um, a little ADD in that regard. Yeah. I just, you know, I have a lot of interest. And so it confuses people sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, you know, some of the content I was putting out beyond weightlifting may have uh, been appealing to your new age modernist mindset at the time, perhaps, right? Because that's where yeah. I was, 2014, 2015. Yep. 2016, that's when I really began to fall. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me a little bit about, you know, our parallel journeys, you know, where, you know, maybe maybe you left because you found Christ before I did. I don't, I don't know the story. Or maybe uh, our journeys were completely parallel and it almost seemed like, you know, Christ spoke to us at the same time. Where did maybe we separate and come back? Yeah, it was it was probably around the same time Um, because, yeah, 2016, 2017, that's when I started really getting out there. Um, And I I remember you had dreads and you were into yoga and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, out um, there. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And um and I don't know. Yeah, I was I was following you a little bit during that time, and and then I just kind of fell away from YouTube and the internet quite a bit. I didn't have a computer for a long time, and I I started to to drift away from the new age stuff, um, and and I started getting into you know self more self improvement and red pill kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I read the rational mail and it's funny because I remembered you talking about Jesus in the past. And I was, I was like, as I was drawing closer to Christ, um, I, I remembered that and I was like, yeah, I wonder where's Elliot at with Christ (laughs) and like, what's, what's he think about this? And so I, I saw videos of you talking to like Rolo Tomasi and some of the mm-hmm. the red pill guys for a while there. And then, yeah, gradually I saw that you were, you were starting to become really fervently Christian, like probably right around the same time for me, it was at what, like 2018, 2019. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's when it really started to, to happen. Yeah. Same so. here for me, 2019. And it's interesting. Maybe we're parallel in this way. Also, it was almost like, the red pill, right? Which I was introduced yep. to by my fans. I have been married and have a great wife, have a great life, have no interest in dating, but mm-hmm. because my fans were struggling with inter- intersexual dynamics and they put me on to this stuff that it in a way led me back to Christ because I started noticing that the things that these red pill guys were saying were Christ without the cross. It was a lot yes. of it was a lot of like yeah, all the good stuff that they want to hear about male leadership and patriarchy and you know understanding uh, um, gender roles and yeah, that was like it kind of like went off in my head. And I was like, wait a second, this is this is all this stuff is in Genesis. You know, this is right. described in the garden. Like this is not brand new, right? And so I, the red pill in a way led me back to the Bible. Yeah, which is, uh, yeah, like I mentioned Jordan Peterson before. He's, I I think he's got kind of a, like he'll lead you in a good direction on certain things and then he'll lead you astray. And I think the red pill can really do that because they have a lot of observations about women and reality and so forth that it's just a, they'll, they'll have correct assessments and observations about things, but the direction they take it is just so black pilled and nihilistic Mm, mm -hmm. and there was something that just never never sat right with me about that but delving more into christianity 
reading scripture, scripture would point out like the raw truth about things, but then, but then it would also tell you how to conduct yourself as a man and be an upright man. Right. Because that was, that was something that I just. And it wasn't all about me. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm straight, like you said, you're not, I will admit I'm egotistical. Like it's just my nature. I think about me first and you know, I, I'm self aggrandizing. And I was like, I don't need any more of that. I don't need anybody else telling me I'm great. I don't need anybody else telling me that I can do it. I know I'm great. I know I can do it. I need somebody to beat me down and tell me, no, you're not that great actually. Yeah. You got to get in line. Right. And that's and, what Christianity did. Yeah, yeah, and it it offers that and um and it also offers hope, the other side of it. So you don't mm-hmm. get beaten down to the point like me naturally I'm pretty masochistic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, but that's that can be that can be a very selfish thing when you start to dwell on oh yeah. how depressed I am or um uh, oh, I've, I'm such a failure. I messed this up. I messed that up. I'm no good, blah, blah, blah. I, 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 me, me, me. And in Christianity, they, they, the word of God tells you specifically not to despair. That that's that's right. the devil whispering in your ear. And you're, you're supposed to be humble. You're supposed to not take yourself too seriously on, on either end of it. You know, when you're way up here and, you know, going down into the depths, is like both of those things are just two sides of the same coin, and it's 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 difficult to to have true humility and right. learn how to learn how to take yourself out of the equation more and think be more oriented towards God and being in communion with Him and being a better person to the people that you love and you have in your life. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things I know you aspire to is to be a husband and to be a father and to have a family and to live a upright, traditional Catholic life with, you know, children and all that. Um, you know, as a 29-year-old man, you know, on your path, developing your skills, getting out there, um, what are your uh, asp- – how do you have hope in and what draws you forward in your search for – having that be a reality in your life or do you just allow God's grace to bring that to you? It's, it's something that I struggle with quite a, quite a bit. Like the past year, um, it's been a, it's been a real struggle trying to hold on to hope Mm -hmm. because you see, Oh, everything's falling apart and the state of women now. And, um, you know, I can't afford to be a provider and all these kind of thoughts. Um, but at the end of the day, all of this is happening because it's God's will. Yeah, He's He's allowing it to happen yeah. for a reason. Like you think you know better than God. You think, oh, things would be so much better if if everything was this way right now. Right. Or if this never happened in the '60s, or you know, since things started. It's easy getting to blame. Yeah, to blame to blame the past generations who you know might mm-hmm. legitimately be at fault for things. But this whole process is taking place for a reason. And I know, I know some of the benefits that I've gained from it. Like if maybe if we were at, weren't where we were at right now and things were just a lot more hunky dory in our culture, then I don't know if I would have any faith or, or my faith might be weaker. So I, I know for sure that the, the things that we've been experiencing have really pushed me towards Christ Mm -hmm. and truth. And that's something to be thankful for. Um, and just, just hoping, uh, holding on to hope for God's plan for my life. It's easy to look back and have regret. Like, oh, if I'd only done this differently or gotten onto this sooner, then, you know, I could be on a much better track right now or I could be more prepared to have a family. But the whole thing is if, if that's the way that it was supposed to be, then it wouldn't, it would have happened that way. But if, if I had Somebody could have given me all the wisdom in the world before I was mature enough to receive it, and it wouldn't have meant anything. So those are some of the things I've been reflecting on lately and realizing, okay, yeah, things are unfolding the way that they're supposed to. And no matter how bleak things seem, um, God doesn't need to prove himself to me. I I need to to trust in him and trust that uh, things are going to be well. And 
and if I didn't have, you know, if I wasn't either pursuing a monastic life or, or taking care of children and having a family and caring for a wife, I could have, I've already spent a lot of time doing the things that I love to do, like I said before. And I know that it's, none of it's really fulfilling at the end of the day. Right. Do we actually really love those things? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, another thing is uh, my friends, uh, Tristan and Dana, the married couple, we we were living together in California. We moved over here because of um, uh, vaccine enforcements and stuff like that. And now we're still all sharing a house and they have two little kids. And it brings so much joy just to be around young kids. It's mm -hmm. like, it's so easy to get apathetic and just like jaded about life. Mm -hmm. But but kids help you relive that experience to some extent. Mm -hmm. And and being able to see that innocence and just enthusiasm for the most simple things in real time and interact. Um, life is so much sweeter with that. Even though I don't have my own kids yet, um, they're basically like niece and, and nephew mm -hmm. to me. And that's when I play with them and see them having fun and everything, it, I, I see that and I think, yeah, I can't wait till I can have this myself. Yeah. Amen. And so we've been, you and I kind of walking uh, parallel paths in a lot of ways, blessed to have you back, you know, as I've come back. Um, you've interacted with a lot of my courses. You've been in, in a bunch of my programs, uh, my King program. Um, did you do my Get the Girl for Life program, the GTG? I have to delve into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you know, you're in the you're in the crew, so you got all of that. Um, kind of a plug here, but yeah. my question is, how has my more recent content or the courses that you've engaged with um, in recent years uh, impacted you? positively today well a lot of it involves stripping away like we're doing fasting in the mm -hmm. program stripping away the the pacifier because for me eating food has always been a source of comfort and trying to numb numb my pain uh so so the extended fasting really brings about a lot of the ugly stuff that you try and sweep under the rug um and reflecting, journaling, taking honest assessments of, of what's happening um, and obstacles that are getting in the way, like clearly spelling out what those things are. And having the group available is huge because I used to try attacking a lot of these things like quitting porn and stuff mm -hmm. on my own. And I've, I've been at it for years. Um, but I, I can say that without, without that accountability, yeah. Uh, I don't think I could do it even, you know, having my own prayer life and so forth. So having, and these guys, there's just so much good wisdom coming from them and you can interact with them in real time. Yeah. And there's, there's so many different sources of wisdom being shared, different books, podcasts. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say the combination of, of the austerity and, and stripping away the things that are just creating more noise in my life and being able to, to talk to other guys who are experiencing similar things and have really valuable perspective to add and being able to inter directly interact with you and ask you questions um, has, has done quite a bit for me. Like I think about if I had just continued to try and struggle by myself through these things, uh, night and day difference. There's no way I'd be able to make yeah, it's so important for men to have a like-minded group of men. Yeah. You know, guys who are on the same path, who have the same values, who are seeking virtue and are destroying vice. Yes. And another part of that, too, is um, you you may be around a lot of people, but how many people are really seeking out those things? Right. A lot of people will shame you for seeking out virtue. You know, I work in construction and you know, promiscuity and just drinking and mm -hmm. doing whatever, just being degenerate is totally promoted there. And I don't know where can you realistically escape from that nowadays. So when you're, when you're surrounded by that all the time, it's, uh, it's going to affect you one way or another. You might be able to resist it, but it's going to be taxing on you. So having a community of people who are just, they're out there, they just might be scattered all over the place. They're not, 
all in, together in one place where you can hang out with each other. But being able to um, keep plugging into that really boosts morale and can keep you going. Mm -hmm. You start to question yourself. Um, or I, I have problems with that. Even even things that I know are true and right and good and beautiful the world will will rub off on you like father uh so father holiday at, at incarnation where we met he had a homily mm -hmm. talking about how you know jesus says you are the salt of the earth and we're constantly being diluted we're constantly having water added to us that's the yeah. world and its effects on us so so with your program and the wisdom there and the other guys to talk to that has really been helpful in retaining that retaining that salt yeah uh, Taylor Marshall, who I had on the podcast a couple weeks ago, says, stay salty. Yeah, <laughs> I got to catch that one. I saw that you uploaded that. And I, I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, he's great. And so um, as, we're, as we're coming full circle here, I, I, I'm curious, you know, you're such a hopeful guy. You're grounded, you know, putting one foot in front of the other and uh, living in faith. What would you, if you had to sort of, predict the future, which of course we can't do, but in a hopeful way, how do you see things unfolding uh, for men who are willing to sacrifice, to destroy vice, and to uh, accept Christ in their life? I think whether whether you're martyred, martyred or you get to experience the fruits of, of the tides turning, um, there is unquestionably a reward at the end of all this struggle. Um, evil cannot prevail. It's just a perversion and inversion of what's good and true and beautiful. And so you have to, if we can think beyond our own lives, um, then there's, that. that's really where you have to be oriented towards. Wow. And that's a tough one because the world has us focused on YOLO, yeah. you know, and, and the, the pleasures of the Another flesh. Another inversion. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know, you don't actually just live once. We have another life after this one. Um, but what I hear you saying, which is totally counterculture, is to keep your eyes on the prize, and that's heaven. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's what's been missing all this time, you know, something beyond. If you don't have that, if you don't have your eyes on, on heaven— or on something greater, even if you can't, you know, stomach Christianity right now, then how are you not going to follow in, fall into the the pleasures of the world? Right. If you and think this is all you have, versus you have this one opportunity to to really sanctify yourself and struggle. Right. Yeah. But that's what you should be doing with your time. You shouldn't be wasting it on cheap thrills. Right. Which never satisfy. Right. You know, just putting in the work, doing the work, right? Works, works based salvation. I don't know how to say it. But yeah. Of course, Christ came to save us. He opened the gates to heaven, opened the gates to hell. Um, but at the same time, we got to do the work. We got to put one front of, foot in front of the other. And, uh, and you're a hardworking man. You're a focused man. You're a grounded man. And I'm um, blessed to know you, brother. Likewise, Elliot. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm humbled to, to be on here today. And, and I want to thank you for for setting such a strong example for men today, and a relatable one too. Yeah, and, uh, I I appreciate greatly all the work that you do. Glory be to God the Father. It's just He working through me. All I can do is get out of the way. I know See, you know you that. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Jesse. Thank you, man. Thank you, Elliot. All right, it's been a pleasure. Been a pleasure speaking with you guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this show. Until next time, I'm out, yo. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, 
Not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.